In this video, I want to just introduce the basic features of an important asset class called fixed income securities, also known as bonds. And this is the world where you find words like gilts, treasuries, corporate bonds as well. So quite a bit of jargon. All I want to do in this video is introduce most of the key bits of jargon that you need to get into this world of fixed income securities. So with no more ado, what are they? Why are they issued? Well, in essence, a fixed income security is normally issued by either a company or a government for one reason. It's to borrow money, right? This is one way for governments to fill the gap between the income they receive, mainly tax, although they get a bit from privatizations and so on as well, and what they spend on defense and healthcare and so on. That gap needs to be filled, and IOUs issued by governments, whether UK or US, are one way to do it. Companies use these as a source of finance too. Companies have various ways to fund their activities. They can use organic growth, which means they're funding their growth from internal cash flows and profits, or they may need to go cap in hand to either people who are prepared to buy these IOUs, bond holders or fixed income security investors, or possibly, and something we'll cover somewhere else in another video, they go to shareholders and raise equity finance instead. But we'll leave that to one side for now. So in essence, a good way, potentially quite a cheap way, for companies and governments to raise the cash that they need. And fixed income security gives you a clue that they're trying to do it in a predictable way from their point of view. They want to commit to fixed coupon or interest payments because that's easier to manage from a cash flow perspective. So the question is, why would you buy them? All very well saying, well, they're issued by these people for a specific reason or a couple of reasons. Why would you buy them? Well, in brief, they're a good diversifier. Okay? That's partly because they're less volatile than equities. Now, diversification is this idea of not putting all your eggs into one basket. It's the idea of spreading your wealth around. So if one bit of your portfolio drops, another bit hopefully won't drop as much or will stay stable. So you don't want to be all in shares or all in property or all in cash. And fixed income securities, which behave a little bit like cash, as we'll see in a moment, you put your money in at the start, you expect to get it out after a fixed period, and you own coupons or interest in the middle, offer one way of diversifying some of your equity risk. All right? And that's principally because they're a wee bit more price stable than things like equities. But on the other hand, they offer a slightly higher return than things like cash. So perhaps a good compromise in the middle there. Stable and predictable income, we well, can get that from equities, but the problem is that um, when companies pay their shareholders dividends, the directors decide how much, and they can be suddenly cut or changed. That's much less of a risk with fixed income securities. The coupon stream that you get tends to be steady, tends to be even, and unless the issuer goes bust, you're quite likely to receive it over the term of the bond or IOU. Many are easy to trade. These days, you can buy and sell these things through a broker in a very similar fashion to the way you might trade stocks and shares. Okay, big improvements in the way these things are traded as far as retail investment investors are concerned recently. And many are ISA eligible. Now, we cover ISAs elsewhere in detail, but that means you can pop many of these things into an individual savings account and shelter them from both income tax and capital gains tax. Now, where do these sit on the risk return spectrum? I did mention this briefly just now, but let's just formalize it. According to a textbook, there is a trade-off between risk and return. In essence, in financial markets, the more risk you take, the higher the return you should expect. And equally, you shouldn't expect high returns unless you're prepared to take a bit of risk. That seems reasonable. No free lunches in this world, after all. So cash tends to sit at the bottom of the spectrum. In other words, low returns. Now, people say that's because it's low risk, but beware the inflation impact on cash, okay? Um, cash isn't risk-free, but it's generally seen as more price stable, for example, than shares. Next, in a textbook, come government bonds. All right, now there is, you might say, you know, what, what's the extra risk from, a, from a, an IOU issued by the British government? I mean, the government's not gonna go bust, so it's not the risk of default. True, but there is a bit of price risk, as we'll see when we cover key features in a moment. Government bonds, unlike bank accounts, can go down as well as up. Next, corporate bonds. Now, why are they next? Um, why are they above government bonds? Well, companies are a bit riskier to invest in than governments, typically, especially AAA rated, high quality governments like the UK and the US. Companies sometimes do get it wrong, okay? They stop being able to pay coupons, they can even go bust. 
right at the top, shares. All right? Undoubtedly, riskier in many ways than, say, cash or government IOUs, but the long-term returns, some would say, justify that risk. So played the right way, shares can offer some pretty decent long-term returns, usually above those from corporate bonds and government bonds. How much above? Well, let's take a quick look. This is annual real returns provided by the Barclays Equity Guilt Study 2001 to 2011. So a snapshot, really, uh, over a 10-year period. So let's have a look. Uh, the percentages up the side here, this is annual after inflation, hence the word real, which means after inflation returns. Equities, a solid performance over that decade. On average, and it does depend exactly which equities you buy, clearly, 5% annual real returns. Next, government bonds, okay? And they come in just above 3%, about 3.4%. Corporate bonds come next, and then cash. Now, two things to say about this particular graph. Cash, you might have noticed the box actually drops. That's because if you sat on cash over this 10-year period, you're actually losing money in real terms thanks to inflation. And one other thing that's worth pointing out here is that the textbook isn't always right. Now, what I mean by that is over this particular 10-year period, government bonds have actually offered a better real return annually than corporate bonds. But wait a minute, on the last slide, didn't you just say it should be the other way around because at the end of the day, government bonds are not as risky? Well, it just goes to show, okay, watch out for the curveballs in financial markets. And over this 10-year period, we've had governments intervening via central banks in their own bond markets, buying up bonds, doing things called quantitative easing. Okay, and basically, to cut long story short, distorting the market for government bonds. So that 10-year period, a little bit unusual. Don't expect that to necessarily be the picture indefinitely going forward. Now, some key features just to round off this introductory video. So what sorts of things would you expect to see if you were to buy one of these corporate or government IOUs? First of all, they carry a coupon. That's also known, if you have a bank account, as interest. And fixed income suggests the amount of that coupon is fixed over time. It's the same amount each six months or year that you hold the bond. They have a maturity date, also known as redemption. So, a bit like a bank account where you put your money in, leave it there, and then pull it out again. Basically, these issuers say, we will give you your money back at a fixed time in the future. It might be 10 years away, it might be 20 years away, but there is a date when you expect the bond to be redeemed. They have a nominal value that fixes the amount of the annual coupon and also determines the amount you get back when the bond is redeemed. And a typical nominal value, you can see that as an amount of a bond is 100 pounds. Not the same as the current price, however. The current price is determined like the price of other assets by supply and demand. Now, just mentioned earlier, if you want to take away some of that price risk on, say, a government IOU, you don't want to worry about it going down as well as up, then you can hold these things all the way through to maturity, all right, and that takes away the sort of wobbles in the middle. But if you trade these IOUs right, between issue and redemption, then, yeah, the price can change. And just to wrap up, for those people you know, still not quite sure what they're buying, the reason I say that fixed income securities are a bit like a bank account is from a cash flow point of view, you put your money in at one end, you get it back out at the other. Let's put some years in. This is now in the middle. And essentially what I'm saying is if that's the end of year one, that's the end of year two, that's the end of year three, that's the end of year four, you buy the bond when it's issued, it's redeemed, you get your money back, you get your £100 nominal value back. And in the meantime, it'll pay a series of coupons, typically every six months. And in that sense, it's a little bit like holding a bank or cash account, where the pattern is fairly similar. So there you have it, a very brief tour of the jargon associated with the asset class known as fixed income securities, aka bonds.